so there were there were question there were a couple questions along those lines um, about if I have a blocked artery um, or two or three, and I'm told I need a new procedure, a angioplasty, a stent, a bypass. Do I have the option to do a program like the Heart Series? Um, Rusty answered that question for the, the few of you who asked it. I think the, the answer to that question is if you're stable, if you're not having symptoms, but if you're diagnosed with blockages, you absolutely have an option. There's plenty of literature to show that the outcomes are equivalent. If you are unstable, if you're having symptoms and they aren't controllable, then you have enough supply demand issue. Your artery is narrowed enough that the muscle is not getting enough. You need a mechanical fix. That's how we would generally look at it. Yep. Okay. So, I, do you want me to? Yeah. Um, good luck. Um, so there, there were uh, uh, several questions. I'm going to try to lump them into categories. There are several questions about the use of salt, and. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and and this is this is a great conversation because there are articles in the literature that say salt is fine. You can eat as much salt as you want, and it's not going to cause any problems. And I think for a lot of people, that is correct. Um, for our patients who have heart disease or who have hypertension or have issues with edema, salt is not good. So. First answer to that question is it's got to be on an individual basis. Can salt be harmful? Absolutely. Um, the problem is you can give two people the same amounts of salt, and one might get hypertensive and one might not. One might develop edema and one might not. So you can't generalize the reaction to the same dose of salt. But I would say that we need salt. We have to have salt. But unlimited salt is probably not a good idea for anybody. There is a clear relationship between salt and hypertension, at least some people. And if you're that person, you don't want, you don't want that to be what you're doing. But, but the point is, you can find literature to support any position you want. You can su and there were several questions. There was a question about, you know, how, why are these doctors suggesting saturated fat is OK? Well, because there's literature that says it is. And, and, and my response to that type of thing is, OK, fine. I give up. Um, saturated fat is OK. But you shouldn't eat meat, and you shouldn't eat dairy, and you shouldn't eat eggs. And, and coconut, another question about coconuts. Is coconut oil OK, which is very high in saturated fats? There's not a lot of literature about coconut and heart disease. I don't know if we'll ever find literature along those lines. But, but my spin on, on saturated fat is, is not to focus on the saturated fat, focus on the food. And, and the way to test it in you as an individual is, let's do a blood test. You go ahead. If you want to have some coconut oil, um, you want to have coconuts, you want to have saturated fat, then go for it. We'll test your blood, but know that the problem is that the foods that saturated fat comes to us with have thousands of chemicals in them, which we're not even looking at. Saturated fat is one of thousands of chemicals in a food. So the way I look at it is, if you look like, like I said, at populations, if you look at populations and you look at what populations eat, foods that have saturated fat are not on the list that's, for me, a positive list. There were questions about eggs. The latest guidelines, the latest nutritional guidelines from the USDA that came out in 2015 took eggs off the bad list. And, and that's because they said there was not enough literature to support. And I think that's, again, correct. But at some point, you have to make a decision. You have to just say, OK, here's what I think is the best thing to do, and here's not. So when people say, can I have one egg a week? It's like, OK, you can have one egg a week. Do you want two eggs? It's, it's not a negotiation. It shouldn't be a negotiation. It, but, but, but I think everybody is entitled to make their own decisions. Um, eggs will create 
Eggs have been related to a higher incidence of cardiovascular disease in diabetics. Eggs have been related to a higher incidence of prostate cancer progression. So there are some downsides, um, but at the same time, have eggs been shown to be the cause of plaque and heart attack and death and dying? No, because there have been studies that the egg industry has, has funded which have said no. So it gets, it, it, it just, it gets, and that's why I think people are confused. So, okay. Um, there were several questions. Let me, I'm trying to get something I can. There were several food questions. Edna. <laughs> what about milk? What about eggs? We talked about eggs. Why don't you want to talk about milk, organic, or regular food? GMO? Oh. So the, the, the topic goes on and on and on, right? It's, it's like, it's layers and layers and layers, and, and you can go deeper and deeper and deeper and make decisions. And so I would say, first of all, look at the populations that are successful. Look at what populations who eat in certain ways, look at the results. Because it was so clear from the study in Bolivia compared to the United States, um, they were clearly just didn't have the risk factors. They were doing very, very well in how they were living. So you need to look at uh, the whole, the thing in totality. And um, I think to try to negotiate this food or that food or this amount or that amount, um, what are your numbers? What is your weight? Are, are you vigorous? Um, How is your blood pressure? I think you need to look at the evidence and then put your, make your decision and put your name on it. And, and it is about responsibility. That's a big part of it. So you are responsible. Who else can eat for you? Who else can chew for you? Who assimilates for you? Nobody. You do it yourself. And um, a lot of times it has to do with emotions and connections. Um, I remember a woman who came to me and she said, you know, I eat perfectly and my coworkers can't understand why I'm morbidly obese because I eat perfectly. But at night, I have hidden ice cream <laughs> and I go eat the whole thing, like a whole box, right, every night. And so because of a connection from her childhood and how she saw ice cream and what it meant for her. And so for me, I, I think it's important to have specific guidelines. I say for my grandchildren, for example, never reward and never punish with food. Not that I ever punish them for anything with anything. <laughs> to add that. <laughs> Nor do they need punishment. They're perfect children. No. <laughs> but um, so what I, I would say that kind of, that's a little bit off uh, maybe from what you asked. But are you rewarding your children? It makes me want to cry when I'm at Barnes & Noble and I see grandmothers and mothers giving a two-year-old a huge uh, brownie. It makes me want to cry. It's like that child is connecting that pleasure of you and the, the time with you with that nasty food. <laughs> And so it, there's a lot of things that go into it. You know, my, my children, like a litany, my grandchildren can say beans, greens, <laughs> rainbows, and whole grains. So that's more important. What are you creating in your life and what are you creating for others? It's not one specific food. Other questions? Question about what is strenuous physical exercise? I, 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 what is strenuous exercise? I'd mentioned moderate. Strenuous exercise is when you're exceeding about 85% of your predicted maximum heart rate. If you're looking at heart rate, you can, you, can, you can estimate your maximum heart rate by taking 220 and subtracting your age. If you're exceeding 85% of that number, you're doing intense exercise. Or you can look at a perceived exertion scale. 
which is a scale from either 0 to 10 or 0 to 20. And if you're at a 0 to 10 scale, if you're at 8, 9, 10, meaning I can't exercise for another 30 to 60 seconds, you're exercising too hard. Or the simplest test is the talking test. If you're ex ex exercising too hard to, to talk in a complete sentence, you're exercising at an intense level. So there's ways to judge it, and, and what I would say is there's probably no real value in heart health for doing that. There were some questions about um, medications. Niacin, for instance. Niacin has had a long life as a, it's a vitamin, and it had a long life as a medicine because it, it can reduce triglycerides in a high dose, it can reduce LDL, it can increase HDL, but in controlled studies, it's never been shown to be effective in preventing um, heart disease events. Um, I used to use it a lot more. Um, now I use it probably sparingly, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that better than niacin is, uh, is plant-based nutrition. So I don't use a lot of niacin. Um, there are several questions about statins. Um, Natural statins, for instance, red rice yeast. Um, natural statins, red rice yeast, is a chemical that comes from yeast that has a molecule in it that has statin-like properties. And it's effective in lowering LDL cholesterol, but not as effective as statins. Can you use it if, you're, if you want to lower your LDL cholesterol? Absolutely but it's all about amounts. Is it safe, generally? Um, can it have the same side effects as statins? Yes, so it needs to be monitored. But generally, it's safe and does not, you don't have to worry the same as you do with a higher dose statin. Um, is it true that statins shut down glial cells in the brain? Oh boy. Um, <laughs> you know, the problem with statins is we don't know a lot about it. Um, no, statins don't shut down glial cells in the brain, but statins can cause or be related to cognition defects, short-term memory loss, um, and, and, and it's variable. So if someone thinks they're taking a drug, and it could be a statin or anything else, and I can't remember where I left my keys or I parked my car, or that's not such a big deal, but when I can't remember why my wife's name or, you know, that's, that, that's a bigger deal. But statins can make it, um, can, can exacerbate that. The only way to get rid of it, to, to, to address it is you stop the drug and you see how you feel. If you think you're having a side effect, one or two, three percent of people with statins are gonna become glucose intolerant, meaning that their blood sugars are gonna go up. If you're one of those people, you'll figure it out by a blood test. Oh, here's the question. Statin have raised my blood sugar. <laughs> oh. Um, uh, so, uh, the things that statins can do as side effects are cognition effects, they can, not, they can affect your blood pressure, and they can affect your exercise capacity by making your muscles sometimes sore, sometimes weak, sometimes you're short of breath, sometimes you're fatigued, sometimes you're weak, sometimes your exercise capacity changes, you can't tell. So you have to stop the drug. That's the only way you can know. We've been using statins for 30 years now. And there are guidelines out that direct us to use very high dose statins, which I'm not a fan of. Um, but you'll see a lot of people coming out of hospitals on very high doses of statins. Um, I generally will reduce that dose and then test, test the blood. I think the higher the dose, the higher the risk. Heredity, there's a question about heredity. And I would say that heredity plays a role in heart disease. Now the heredity that's important is called nuclear family heredity. Brother, sister, mother, father. Doesn't matter what Aunt Joan or Uncle Tom or your grandfather had. That's not relevant to you in terms of heart disease. It's only brother, sister, mother, father, who developed heart disease before the age of 60 or 65. 
If they developed it when they're 75, 85, 95, it's not a risk factor for you. Heredity probably influences heart disease 10%. The rest is all about how you live your life. Um, when people um, become resigned to the fact that my family has always had this problem, so I'm going to have this problem, you can redirect that anxiety because it's not correct. Um, protein, where does protein come into this? <laughs> I like that one. And, and, and then there are questions about carbs. Um, my answer to protein is don't worry about it. Um, we can give you the numbers, um, 0.36 milligrams of protein per pound is what you should eat, but you're gonna get plenty of protein in a whole food plant-based diet. You don't need to count calories, you don't need to count milligrams of anything because you're going to get enough. Um, so protein will take care of itself. Is animal protein and plant protein better, worse? They're the same. Protein's made up of amino acids. Animals and plants all have the same amino acids. The difference, and that's why milk puts a little mustache on you, and, and eggs, because they're, complete, they're called complete proteins, meaning you get all the amino acids. But if you combine, um, if you combine rice and beans and squash, you're getting, all the, you're getting all the amino acids. So you have to be maybe a little more clever in combining them. You don't need them all at the same meal. So animal and plant protein would come out as equivalent. Um, you want to say anything about coconut oil? One of your favorite topics? It's, a, it's interesting. Um, there are studies that show that if you eat a lot of oil at one time, your coronary arteries will spasm. So I think it's important to understand that if you're eating high fat, the, it will become sluggish. It's like you just throw oil down your sink and the water will be sluggish. So it's not a good idea to eat a lot of, a lot of fat at any one time. Um, I, I don't think there's evidence. The literature, I mean, it's not, the, the studies haven't been done. There's nothing comparable to say, um, like Ornish has done or Esselstyn, um, to prove oil uh, about coconut oil. And the co populations that live where coconuts are plentiful, I don't think they go overboard on coconut oil. I mean, uh, so I think it is a saturated fat, but it certainly isn't a health food. And I, and I don't, uh, I'm not a proponent or, or a fan of, the, of the, the literature that talks about that because it's not a study that you can stand on. It's not something that you can really look at and say, yeah, this is great evidence. It's not even like our little slide of the heart series. There's nothing like that. Nobody's taken 100 people and really studied them in a, in a, in a scholarly way. It hasn't happened. So um, it is a real food. But again, if you take any food, so if you take coconut and you, and you eat it and you have the coconut water, um, it's, it's wonderful, it's hydrating, it has tons of potassium, it's really good for you. If you take coconut and you, and you put it like the, in Thai food or something like that, you know, you're using the whole food. Um, I think that that's uh, probably fine in moderation, but when you take one part of a food, uh, so let's take coconut, you take one part and you take coconut oil and you start using a lot of it, I don't think that's healthy and I think it's a processed, highly processed food. If you take soybeans, and you take everything out of the soybean except the protein and you make it textured vegetable protein, I'm not a proponent of that. It, that is not a whole food either. If you take wheat and you take everything out of it except the white powdery stuff and it makes great bread. Or <laughs> but it, you know, it's a highly processed food. So you've processed the soy, you've processed the coconut, you've processed the, what else did I say? the oil, <laughs> the wheat, the wheat. So um, that, you know, and, and I'm not on a statin and I, when I say, what did I, what was I saying? <laughs> what, what happened there?
but I, but I did have a concussion. Somebody hit me at 80 miles an hour. And the good thing about that is that because, uh, of course, everything is my daughter says, Mother, have you ever noticed that every conversation comes to Tai Chi? And so I have to come to Tai Chi. And because of Tai Chi, I'm doing great, except that I do lose my words sometimes as a result of the concussion. But um, so that's my answer. Processed food, no matter what, not a good idea. Eat whole, plant-based. And, and what about animals, blah, blah, blah? Eat greens and eat greens and eat lots of rainbows and eat whole grains. And if you still have room, you know, for some animal, think about that. There's a, <laughs> there's a question about fish. The literature would suggest that populations that eat fish do better than um, in, in terms of heart health. Um, following, there's some evidence following heart attacks in an Italian study that fish eaters had a better prognosis than, than not. The, the best prognosis is probably in people who don't eat any meat at all. But if we're just talking about fish, which do have a high, and this is fatty fish, the salmon, mackerel, trout type fish, um, you're going to get more omega-3, but you're also going to get a lot of saturated fat and, and potential um, mercury or other heavy metal toxins. So do we recommend fish? No. Do we, do we, is it on the bad list, like we what we'd say for red meat and processed meat? No. It's kind of somewhere in the middle. It's floating <laughs> in, the, in the water. And, and it, it's, it's probably not a poison, um, but it's not something we recommend strongly. Uh, there, was quest, there was some questions about studies of Dean Ornish and Caldwell Esselstyn. Um, these two doctors did studies on small numbers of patients using a plant-based nutrition, um, maybe with a little low-fat yogurt, um, and showed that heart disease could be reversed and stabilized. Um, they, they, to me, are kind of giants in the field because they were the first ones to really show this. Um, their numbers are small. There's all kinds of criticism that you can make about the work they did, but I think that their um, their integrity is is solid. Their evidence base is solid, and we are we are supportive and practice the same kind of recommendations they make. Raw foods, raw foods. Um, if we're talking about just plant-based raw foods, it's not not sushi. Um, is one better than the other? I don't have any evidence to support raw versus cooked being one better than the other. I think that would be a matter of taste. Do you have any feeling about that? Raw uh, versus cooked vegetables? No, I think, I think that comes back to people in their digestive system and what works for them. And that's why everybody has to create their own, their own plan, their own diet. What works for you? Do you feel better? And so if somebody says, you have to eat raw food and it makes you have diarrhea every day, that's not going to be very good. But maybe another person, the raw food works really, really well for them. And they like it and, and they feel more energetic and they feel good. And so it's, it's a question of um, individual. People need to do things individually. According to your, you know, again, coming to your pleasure and, and your memories and that kind of thing, um, people need to think about that because if you feel deprived and punished and, and you're in mourning because you've changed your diet, that's not what we're talking about, right? We have three people up here who are, who are loving it, who are delighted, who are flourishing, and that's really the point. What, what's going to help you flourish? What's gonna, what is a nice memory for you? Um, and how can you have that memory or how can you have that pleasure or how can you have that love without the bad food if you were unfortunate enough to have that connection with a, a whopper? You know, a, if that's your love, um, then you have to think about what was the real love. Maybe the real love was the grandparent. Maybe the real love was the father. Maybe the real love was the aunt or the uncle who, who loved you and took you for something special. Um, and you can think about that, about people caring about you and about connections, because that's what's healing. We can go about 10 more minutes if you're okay with that. I got lots of questions. Uh, <laughs> um, some, some of you writ, wrote very personal questions, um, kind of medical advice type questions. I, I don't do that, but I'd be happy to talk to you afterwards. 
Um, but I, I might generalize something that you wrote so I could answer it generically. Um, there's some, a couple questions about CRP, C-reactive proteins. Um, it's a nonspecific test. Um, it's an inflammatory protein that's produced in the liver, a sign of inflammation, but doesn't tell you where the inflammation is coming from or, 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 or really what the inflammation is going to do. There's a couple of studies that basically tell us if the CRP is high, you're at a higher risk for an event. But we have to understand that CRP can be high because you've got arthritis or you just had pneumonia or a urinary tract infection or you just had a, some kind of physical injury. So we have to put CRP in the, into context. It's not a test with the same significance as uh, like a cholesterol, for instance. Questions about cholesterol ratios. Um, some people have a very high cholesterol and a very high HDL, and their cholesterol HDL ratio is less than four. Um, the cholesterol HDL ratio is probably more important than the individual numbers themselves. So we look at all of it. But if your cholesterol HDL ratio is less than four, that's probably a healthy ratio, and we would be inclined not to treat it unless you had, unless you had definite disease. Is there a relationship between dental plaque and plaque in the arteries? No. Um, there were some questions about rhythm, um, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not going to be able to address those. I'm sorry about that. There was a question about carbohydrates. It was just written as carbs, question mark. Um, and I would say yes. <laughs> Now, the important thing about carbs, as with other things, is what are we talking about? What carbs are we talking about? Because there are whole food, plant-based carbohydrates, which are the foods we should be eating. There are processed carbohydrates, which are foods we shouldn't be eating. There are added sugars, which are carbohydrates. You know, whether it's glucose or sucrose or a high fructose corn syrup or maltodextrin or molasses or honey, there's a whole raft of different carbohydrates that are added to our foods that are unhealthy. So when we talk about carbohydrates as being the foundation of a healthy diet, it's whole food plant-based carbohydrate. Can I ask a question? No. No. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Yes. I was watching a TV show and the woman said, um, I think it was a local show, we're going to fix some cauliflower and she's talking about the cauliflower and she said, and the best thing about this, it's no carbs. And I thought, really? You know, if you, look up car, uh, if you look up cauliflower, it is mostly carbohydrates. Um, so to divide food out like that, it, it's, it's, a, it's a bit um, erroneous and we're making a mistake because if you look it up, cauliflower is a carbohydrate. It has very little of, of anything else and, um, and it's a great food. And so we've maligned it and we've suddenly started talking about carbs as though it's something bad but we really have to make a distinction. If it's a, if it's a real food, a whole food, what do you think food is made out of? Everything has some carb and some fat and some protein. Everything. Along those lines, I would, I would just say where there was a question about the glycemic index, which is an index which we can measure which if you eat a food and the way the tests are done, it, you eat one food, a certain amount of that food, and then we measure to see how high the blood sugar goes and compare it to sugar. Um, foods that have a very high glycemic index are foods that will tend to cause insulin to spike. And as insulin spikes, bad things will happen. Fat will be deposited in the liver. And there's a whole litany of things that will, will occur. Um, but um, foods that have been targeted as been as kind of on the no list, such as carrots or potatoes, because they have a high glycemic index, I don't ascribe to that. I think if it's a whole food and you're eating it as part of a meal, that you don't have to be that specific and that reductionist in terms of what you eat. You want to comment on that? Yeah, I think I agree. I think if you make a meal out of just carrots, that might not be such a good idea, but, and especially if you glaze them. <laughs> 
you add some sugar, you know, that, that wouldn't be a good idea. But if it's part of a, of a whole plate of food and it's one of the things, sure. And, and the other thing is whole foods have the uh, phytonutrients or the plant foods, and so you're getting way more than carbs and protein and, and fat. Um, there, then there are all the nutrients that are in the food. And Dr. Campbell talked about um, the study that was done on apples. And so it may, say for example, it maybe just has 100 milligrams of vitamin C in an apple. But when they tested it, when you eat the whole apple in your body, it acts like 1,500 of a pill. So it's not a good idea to take the pills. It's a good idea to eat the apple. <laughs> Eat the orange, eat the whatever, eat the real food, eat the whole food, eat the fiber with it. If One of the things that if you're talking about food, maybe if you had one word, and I agree with that, some, I, it's not my own, um, I didn't think of this, it's not an original thought, but I agree with it. And if you're thinking of one thing that you need to eat, and it's fiber, eat a lot of fiber. Thank you. Yeah, we didn't mention fiber, kind of mentioned it, but. Um, someone had a question about scar tissue. If you've had a bypass, are you, are, are, are you um, going to have to have another bypass? Is there a time limit on it? The answer is no. But what some of the research shows is that the heart healthier your lifestyle is, the longer your bypass is going to last. People who smoke after a bypass, they're going to come back. People who have hypertension that's untreated, people who have cholesterol that's untreated, it's gonna, you're going to come back because plaque is going to form in the artery and you're going to need more work. So bypasses do not have a given length of time if you take care of them. Medication interactions. There were some questions about this medicine and that medicine. All medicines, when you think about it, they go to every part of your body and they're going to interact with each other. So you have to be very aware of what, how you're feeling. You want to take as few medicines as possible and if you think you're having a side effect, the only way to handle it, unless it's an obvious side effect that your doctor will take you off the medicine for, is you stop it for a week, a week or probably a month, and you see if you're concerned about medication interactions. Um, someone asked about the definition of ischemia. Uh, 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 that's, that's a, I think, a, a good question. Ischemia um, means, from whatever it's coming from, that tissue somewhere in the body, it could be anywhere from your big toe to your brain to your heart, is not getting enough nourishment. It's ischemic. The blood flow to that part of the body has been decreased. So ischemia means lack of blood flow. And that's all, folks. <laughs> I, I got some others I can't, I can't answer. So I, I would like to thank you for coming and sitting through all this and, and, and listening to, to me and, and, uh, and sharing and letting the panel share their stories, which I just think are so inspiring and so fascinating for multiple different reasons. And I particularly want to thank Edna for being my partner for so many years in, in doing what we do. And um, maybe we'll do this again in a year. Thank you. <laughs>